Uh, dear colleagues, dear audience, I'm pleased to welcome everyone to our online seminar on contemporary area studies. And today uh, our speaker is a professor of Thomas More University from Belgium, Bert van Thielburg, with the topic Trends and Future in this Transitional Roaring Twenties over the 21st century. So uh, in, with accordance uh, with uh, the rules of our seminar, we have approximately 40 minutes for report. And then we will have uh, um, questions to our speaker after the report. So, dear Bert, I give you the floor. And okay. you, you are more than welcome. Okay, thank you very much, Irina. Dobry vetche, studenti e professora. That's the only Russian I know. I hope I pronounced it uh, quite well. But uh, first of all, I would like to introduce myself because the theme of today will be the transi transitional 20s, the roaring 20s, as Irina mentioned, and the topic of today will be from care to opportunities. But first, a, little, a few words about myself. I'm Bert van Tilburg. I'm in fact an historian. I studied in Antwerp and at the University of Leuven. And at the beginning of my career, in fact, I was a history teacher and also an art history teacher. And I did that at uh, nearby my, uh, my living place in Antwerp. And uh, I also combined it because I also wanted to be an entrepreneur and I combined teaching with entrepreneurship and I started to found my own company in 1996 and it was a publishing company and I did it. I was busy with multimedia and with new technologies and with interesting things with video games with a lot of interesting stuff. But in the year 2000, I transformed my company into a PR marketing communication agency. And transformation is one of the topics that is really in my mindset. And as we see today, we are in a full transition, in a full transformation. But I will be speaking about that uh, a, little, a little bit later. What I do today, I'm in, in fact, I'm, an, uh, I'm a professor at a university college in, uh, in Mechelen, Thomas More, as, as uh, Irena mentioned, but I also work uh, I have my own company and I give trend lectures like today. I give it in real life, which is what I like the most, but today with COVID, it's not possible. But today it's even possible to teach you in Moscow and that's amazing and fantastic. I also write trend analysis and I might make trend reports for companies and I organize trend inspiration trips to beautiful countries, to beautiful cities, and also to in interesting uh, industries. And of course, I am also busy with strategic future thinking and innovation, and I give some workshops. But enough about myself. Today, I will speak with you about the trends in the third decade of the third millennium. And what we experience today is disruption. We're in the middle of a transition. And in fact, that transition was running very smoothly but it was accelerated by a wild card. And now you can think, what does it mean with a wild card? And for me, and in fact, it's a kind of definition that's used in strategic future thinking, we describe a wild card as an event or a series of events causing tremendous disruption and changing society abruptly. And human history is in fact a series of wild cards and we can divide them into natural wild cards. We have wild cards caused by human behavior, and even we can combine both. You have wild cards from the combination humans, human behavior, and nature. I give you some examples to be a bit more specific. This was maybe the first wild card in history. It, it, in fact, it's an image of a meteorite implosion on the Yucatan. Peninsula in Mexico, in Mexico. And it happened around 66 million years ago. And what was in fact the result? The result was disruption because at that moment, the dinosaurs were, let's say the most prominent species on earth and they vanished, they disappeared after this implosion. And of course, today we see that there are still pelicans and crocodiles, which can be described as direct descendants, but it immediately gave an opportunity for a new species, the mammals. Uh -huh. Human beings, the humans emerged. 
This is the first natural wildfire. Another one happened 140 years ago. It, to be specific, this is a, an image of the Krakatoa. It's in Indonesia. It's a volcanic eruption. It happened on the 27th of August, 1883. And a volcanic eruption also causes disruption. Tidal waves up to 30 meters high. Observers at that moment even saw some ripple effects in the North Sea. So something that happened more than 20,000 kilometers from the North Sea. But we saw some effects on the North Sea. Even the explosion of the Krokatoa was literally heard in Australia, more than 4,000 kilometers away. Ash clouds went up 50 kilometers in the atmosphere and causing disruption because the temperature worldwide dropped with two degrees. And this was a catastrophe for agriculture worldwide. So a volcanic eruption and mega tsunamis and earthquakes and things like that are disruptors, are wild cards. But you also have wild cards caused by human behavior. This is an image of a painter. And this is the image of the French Revolution in 1789. It meant the end of class society, the end of clergy, the end of novelty, and the, the end of common people. And a new society arose based on other principles like freedom, equality, fraternity. This came into place into that old society, that medieval old society. Something completely new came along. And that was interesting. But we have some other examples as well caused by human behavior like world wars. And last century, we had two ones. And Russia, it was also very disrupting for Russia, World, wars, world War II especially, with a lot of, a lot of people dying uh, because of the war. It was caused by human behavior. And then we also have human greed. Remember Wall Street crash in 1929 in, in New York, but also the banking crisis 10, 12 years ago. It caused amazing disrupt disruption. Even it was maybe at that moment a complete standstill of the economy. And it took maybe it was a fraction of the total economy would collapse at that moment. So let's say the, the results were very dramatically, were very uh, intense. And that's what, what's happening with, in fact, with all these kinds of wild cards. I gave you some examples of, of nature, human behavior, and then you can combine them. And then you have examples like this one. This was the plague in the Middle Ages. It happened, the plague, the big plague in 1347-1351. It took place for four years. And there was a French historian, Froissart, and he said at that moment that in, the, in his known world, which was in fact not America because it wasn't discovered at that moment, but it was the Western world and even Asia and, and also Russia. In that world, one on three people died. They were, it was said that at that moment, there were around 600 million people on earth and 200 million people died. It was, a, it was a big, if you combine it today with COVID, COVID is nothing compared to the plague. But the results of the plague or the, the impact of the plague was very big. And I can give you some, some interesting things that you can compare today with COVID. For example, you can say that there are always people blamed. Right? And, and especially for the plague, two kinds of people were blamed. In the first place, they blamed the Jewish, the Jewish people. And it was the beginning of pogroms. It was the beginning of massively uh, bringing down Jewish people. It was also, the, it was also the, the people of the church, the clergy was blamed. And in fact, the plague, which took place in the 14th century was in fact, let's say the motor, to, the motor for the reformation, which started on a century later. So if you combine it with today, Donald Trump, former president Donald Trump also spoke about COVID as the Asian disease, as the Chinese disease. He blamed Asian people, he blamed the Chinese. 
And we saw some people uh, in, in, some, in America, Asian people that were, let's say, blamed and people were uh, making problems with them. And we also saw this, the same, same things happening in France, in some French cities. The plague was also the beginning of a complete new world because at that moment, a lot of people died, but it also offered opportunities for the people that survived. The wages became better, people had better jobs because a lot of people were dead. It was also the beginning of a complete way of new, new arts. It was also the beginning of the Renaissance. And, and, always, and also in art history, it was the beginning that we see, to, to, uh, to give an image of that, we saw skeletons on, on pictures and on, and on paintings. It was a complete new world with new possibilities, new opportunities after the plague. Maybe we can find a new way today, a new way, a new way to, to build the society after COVID-19. This is an open question. Also, some, another example was the Spanish flu, also a, a disease that took place 100 years ago, just after World War I, and, and ha having more victims than the soldiers in World War I. World War I. And now we have COVID, COVID-19. The impact is huge. If you see what, what governments are doing today, delivering money, uh, supporting companies, supporting people, the cost is enormous. To give you an example, in Belgium, we have a deficit of 40 billion euros. Now the deficit is going up to 140 billion dollars or euros, excuse me. So, and that's only because of COVID. And somebody has to pay it back at the end. The impact is huge you can now you can see okay the most of the things that the most of the examples that i give are examples that are positive uh, uh, negative excuse me and uh, we can say wild cards are mostly negative and wild cards are combination of human behavior or co uh, human be nature human behavior and a combination of both but there are also some positive wild cards and that's very interesting to to follow as well as well a very interesting positive wildcard is the discovery of fire. It has brought some innumerable benefits to mankind. We learned to prepare food because of fire. It kept us warm in the beginning in the cages, later in the houses. And fireplaces are also connecting places, bringing people together in, 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 in telling stories and share their daily experiences. It's a very interesting thing. Imagine a world where, where, we didn't, where we didn't have fire. Or this invention or discovery, the wheel. The wheel is also a very inspiring and very intriguing uh, uh, in, in, in discovery. It means that the wheel brought enormous contributions to our mobility. Very interesting to follow. And also this one, money, is also a positive wildcard. Is a, it's a very interesting technological resource based on convention and making transactions possible, making trade possible, easier than bartering. And it also meant the beginning, when we started with money, the beginning of a gigantic industry with banks, with financial products, with exchange uh, offices, with accountants and things like that. Very positive wildcard, but also the industrial revolution. Making, making a lot of, making mass production possible for a bigger audience for lower prices, more products for lower prices. This was made possible by the industrial revolutions of the past centuries. And of course, the computer, making our lives easier, also the internet, and also, of course, robotization, automation, artificial intelligence. This will make our lives more interesting and more positive. And then you can say, can you make a kind of summary of these wildcards? Yeah, I can give you some insights. What we experience today is that the impact of wildcards is becoming more and more global and wildcards are coming faster and faster. In my, I'm 53 at this moment. In my life, I experienced four major wildcards, very big ones. But students today, 
And people that are born today, they will experience maybe six or seven wild cards that will disrupt their lives completely. So they're coming faster and the impact will more and more be more and more uh, globally. And you can predict wild cards. You can imagine them and you can be trans, you can try to build your company and your vision based on these wild cards. And that's very interesting to follow. Imagine some future wild cards. I give you three examples very quickly. This could be an interesting wild card. And this is namely a, a solar wind, a solar storm. Imagine if this happens and it can happen. It happened in 1582, the first time. It was, uh, there were some, there are some records of that, that in 1582, there was a, a solar wind. Imagine if this would happen today. This means that if this comes into our atmosphere, a solar wind, that electricity is vanished. And it takes us at least six months till maybe two or three years to reorganize and reinstall all electric equipment and electric factories worldwide. It's a, dis it's a disruption. Imagine what our lives would be because we are over consuming electricity at this moment. How will we, we manage to do this? How will we survive it? It's predictable. It can happen to our society. Maybe not in our lives, but it will happen again. Take, in, take this into account. Another example, well, imagine if biological weapons could be combined with terrorism. Then we can have bioterrorism. This can happen and can cause retaliation and disrupt countries and continents all over the world. Or this one, and this one is one we have already, we know this is happening, climate change. But a lot of people don't feel it in their daily lives. There is, for a lot of people, still no sense of urgency. But we have to be concerned. I think there could be a solution. And the solution for this could be four different things combined. First of all, maybe we have to think about massively shrinking worldwide birth rate. The second one, we have to adapt our human behavior. Thirdly, technological solutions. And fourthly, this is a very interesting one, maybe we have to go to new frontiers, visiting, exploring, and maybe inhabiting neighboring planets. This could be a solution for this kind of problems in the future. But to summarize, wild cards are linked to change. And normally, our society is changing very slowly. We like that changes are very slowly because we can prepare. When something is changing slowly, we have time to adapt. But with a wild card, you don't have a lot of time. And you see that today, the speed and the intensity of change is increasing. And how can we have a clue how to cope with that? Therefore, we have to go to a model that has been created, that had been created by um, a psychiatrist. The name is Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. And she has a kind of model a curved model, and she, she says that there are six stages, six phases. And you can, because this model is being cre is, is created for completely something else. This is created for a, a process of grief when people are losing uh, a relative or uh, some, a beloved one. People are going into the, those phases, those stages. But the same happens when people experience big changes in a, in a wild card or in a disrupting situation. I can give you the, let's say, the application of, of this curve model on COVID-19, this specifically. In the first stage, we had denial. And you know that COVID-19 happened in, it, it started in Wuhan, in China, in December 2019. And in the beginning, a lot of people thought, oh, it's only a Chinese disease. 
or it's only happening in China. It won't go worldwide. So we denied it. Even I denied it. And I think a lot of you denied it. It's normal. We denied it. But then we heard that, that there were some cases in America, that there were some cases in, in South Korea, that there were some cases in Russia, in France, in Italy, in Belgium, in the Netherlands, in Germany, in England. And suddenly it was all over the place and we couldn't stop it anymore. And then we went, we had some, the, the governments were in complete panic and they started with lockdowns. And then we went in a second phase, frustration. Our freedom was taken away. And we like our freedom in the Western world. It was taken away, like that, taken away. We were frustrated. And some people went into depression. Today, still today, a lot of people suffer from COVID depression, feeling lonely, feeling completely isolated, not, not seeing colleagues, only working at home, staying at home, working remotely. A lot of people in Belgium and it's worldwide, they talk about social distance. This is a complete absurd term. This is not correct. It's physical distance because we are social, hum a human being is a social human thing. We need social activities. We need, we need to socialize with people. So it's physical distancing, not social distancing. It's completely absurd. But a lot of people are still in depression. And then you see the fourth stage is experimentation, experiment. We saw it with people um, that were trying to find ways to, to do business that uh, take away for restaurants, for example, remote working, remote studying like you today. These were examples of experiment. And in the fifth stage, you go to decision. You are making new rules and you find new ways of working and you find you, you try to cope with the new normal and you find ways to, 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 to implement that. And then you go to integration, making the best of it and seeing it as a new normal and maybe combining the old and the new ways. These things are happening to all of us during COVID and some people are still in denial. I hope you are, you are not. I hope you're still in, uh, in experiment or in decision. If you can make the, the time frame very, very, very limited, it's good, then you're quite positive. If you make it long, it's a hell of a job to get into these positive elements, okay? This is important, change. Transitional 20s, you see, this is my trend frame. And I speak about COVID trauma and post-corona opportunities. You see care and opportunities. Okay, care is still in the, in the way. If we go back to the previous slide, care is about yeah, the depression side before experimentation. If you go to experimentation and integration, you go more to the positive side. Let's go more to the positive side today, more into the opportunity from care to opportunity, but you need to have trust. You need to have perspective. And that's what's happening today. We have perspective with the vaccinations. We have perspective. I also said to Irina, 2020 was a hell for a lot of people, not for everybody, because that's also the case with wild cards and crisis that some people are winners and you have losers. Some people benefit from it and some people suffer from it. But a lot of the most people suffer from it. But we have to have trust and find perspective and see perspective. And then we can go to opportunity. And then, and this, this is the rest of the, of, the, of the keynote, will be about transformation, connection, and convenience. Let's go to transformation. And a lot of people are thinking, yeah, but transformation is all about technology. It's about 5G, 6G, Internet of Things, 3D printing. It's about virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, automation, robotization, and artificial intelligence. It's all about that. But it's more than that. It's not only technology. It's about real transformation. I give you an example to think about. Think in a world within five or 10 years, and it will, it will be possible, 
that we have a world where we have only self-driving electric cars. Imagine this, complete transformation. The impact will be huge. What about all the cars with combustion engines? What about the petrol stations? What about driving schools, if it's self-driving? What about garages where to put our cars under our carports? Are we, what about cars that are going to drive around all the time and will pick up people? If we no longer have to own cars, but we still want to use them, it's maybe the final end of company cars, which is very, very popular in Belgium and leasing companies. But also look at the benefits. Less traffic jam, fewer road casualties, less people dying in, tra in, 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 in traffic, but also maybe the cars will be completely redesigned totally differently. Maybe it will be like, like bubbles, like isolation bubbles where you can work, or maybe you can do uh, organize a vodka tasting in your car, a new vodka that you can taste. This can be made possibly, this can be made possible in the future. It's transformation. It's also about jobs. Um, these are, this is McKinsey. McKinsey is saying that one in two jobs will be gone forever after the artificial intelligence and the automation revolution. More than 2 billion people will lose their job before 2030. This is one side of the coin. But you have to imagine that for each job that will disappear, two new ones will occur. This is a positive story. Everybody is saying, yeah, but it's a negative story because I'm working uh, as a sales person and 60% of the jobs will disappear. I will be probably one of them. That's negative perspective. Imagine, imagine 25 years ago, if people would say, I'm a drone operator, everybody would have laughed with that guy. He thought he was mad, he was nuts. No, it's not mad, it's possible. There are students today in this class. I can guarantee you that you will do jobs in the future that don't exist today. You will do that. Imagine the same with big data architects and, and even social media internships. It's just a matter of openness. It's a mindset shift. It's constant training. It's lifelong learning. It's adaptive intelligence. That are the most dominant skills. And that have to, you have to keep in mind if you prepare for the future. It's also transformation of work. This is an office in 1890. This is an office in 1890. Take a closer look. You will see an office in 2019, 120 years later. And now I can, yeah, my wife is uh, making copies. Sorry for that. It, it will take one minute. Um, in, you can see the both pictures now. You can see the picture of 1890 and a picture of 2019. It's the same. In, in, it's the same. Just the people in the, in, in, eight, in the 19th century are working, working with paper. They are working, they have other clothes, but they are working in the same way as people that are working in 2019. They are just using computers and laptops and more technology. But in fact, it's the same. Okay, the, 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 the fashion is different. People in the old age have uh, other dresses like the people of uh, 2019. But in fact, it's the same. So if somebody time travels from the left picture to the right picture, give him one week time and it will be up and running in the, in the new working system. It will be up and running after one week of training and coaching. If you learn him to or her to work with a computer and give him the give him the, the equipment, he can work with that. We still so fundamentally we still organize office work in the same way like we did 120 years ago or 130 years ago. Some people say this is tradition. 
you don't change tradition. I can give you a beautiful expression. Tradition is peer pressure from dead people. Tradition is peer pressure from dead people. We are still using the old industrial mindset. We are going to an office. We are working from nine to five. We receive a monthly wage. And we are not judged because we are creative. No, we are judged because we're responsible and we are active in an office. And what we are doing today is ticking off our to-do list. We're not doing more than that. Most of the time we are doing this. We have a to-do list and we are ticking off when one, once a task has been performed. Are we just judged on creative abilities, on empathy, on insights, on entrepreneurial spirit? No, we are not. And this is something that will completely change in this decade. This transformation is already taking place and COVID-19 accelerated this. It will change. It will go more into productivity. It's not about FaceTime. FaceTime, not a program of Apple, but FaceTime, I'm the boss, you're the employee, and I see you working in my office and I pay your monthly wage. That's FaceTime. Now it's more about teamwork, collaboration, productivity, about output. What do you perform for my company? Not the time that you spend on a certain task. It's about creativity, problem solving, thinking out of the box, co-creating, interdisciplinary work, more on a output. This means if you go, if you take this into account, then the complete workforce of the future will completely change radically, dra dramatically, drastically, not dramatically, drastically. This means we can work from all over the world. We have in Belgium expressions like workcation, work vacation, workcation. It's a nice word. Fantastic. This means you could, Irina could work from a beach in Spain or Portugal, and she give you, she can give you a class from that beach. Fantastic. This is possible. But it also means that the employees of the future are not only from your own country. The workforce is globalized. If you can work everywhere, it doesn't depend if you're from Africa, Asia, America, or Europe. It doesn't depend. It's, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. Even if we are working at home, we see in Belgium today, a lot of architects are transforming and transforming um, garden, uh, garden uh, places into offices. A lot of people like to work in, in the garden, in nature, seeing the trees, seeing the plants, seeing the grass, the green grass, fantastic. But it also means that a lot of real estate companies could collapse in the near future because all have invested in offices, in expensive offices for companies. And a lot of companies see that people are working from home remote. So what to do with empty offices? In the, they have to transform as well. Maybe they can use these spaces for co-creation spaces. Maybe spaces where people can, because people will come to offices, but not to work. It's to socialize. It's to collaborate. It's to, to, uh, yeah, to make, uh, yeah, to do small things to do team buildings, but at home, you're the most product, pro, uh, productive and that will happen. And this means for big office spaces today that you will have new destinations. It will be maybe uh, social housing that could, be re, that could be replaced in these empty spaces. Or it could be um, schools, because in Belgium, the school buildings are very old fashioned, outdated. Why not use these kind of new spaces, office spaces? It's possible. It's completely thinking out of the box for the transformation that's taking place. Life work balance will be, there will be fluidity. Sometimes you will work at home and you will do some personal things as well. And the same if you go maybe one or two days to a kind of office environment, it will be fluid. Work and, and life 
will be mixing. It will be mixed in the future. This is an, an interesting exp experiment that happened with Aldi, Aldi in Germany. Aldi collaborated with McDonald's. And it was at the beginning of the pandemic in Germany because there was a problem with McDonald's. They had to close down because of the lockdown. But Aldi had a lack or a lack of personnel. They needed extra employees because the supermarkets were completely, a lot of people went to the supermarkets. So they had they, they needed extra extra employees and they exchanged. Uh, there was a possibility for people working at um, McDonald's to work for Aldi. This is very interesting because the takeaway from this is that there will be flexibilization of work in the future. It allows companies to make agreements, agreements with one another to, let's say, to exchange employees. I think in the future, uh, one employee can maybe work for three companies. It's in fact a kind of freelancer. The world will be more and more freelancers. We will have more and more freelancers in our workforce in the future. So the question for you is, how can I respond to the digital transformation? How can I respond? And what's for me important in the complete transformation in the way of working, in the way of living? That's an interesting question. You don't have to give the answer today, but think about it. Reinvent yourself as an organization, but also as a person. A second thing, connection. I will take a very few minutes about this, it's very small, but transitional 20s are also about connection. Even before Corona, even before Corona, there was a lot of loneliness. There was a search for real connection. It has been a big challenge for all categories, for all ages, a big challenge. Connection, finding connection. And even COVID-19 made it worse. I can give you an example. The, uh, the example, I can predict some things. Like psychiatrists are going to have a lot of cues. They will have a lot of work in the next, the next years to come. Also the same for personal coaches. It will be one of the top jobs of this decade. Also relationship counselors, providing relationship training to achieve lasting, deeper human empathic connections. It's not if we have a lot of friends on the internet or social media that we are really connected. I give you the example of Japan. The hikikomori, it's the lost generation of Japan of youngsters between 18 and 25. I think around 3 million Japanese youngsters. They live in complete isolation. They call them the hikikomori. They're only occupied in their, in their room, busy with the computer, but not, not having real friends. It's dramatically, it's dramatic. The same in South Korea. In the South, South Korean vocabulary, a, a, a few new words uh, came along, like hombuk, hombap. This is eating alone. Honsul is drinking alone. Honjong is going alone to the, to the theater. It is about activities that you do alone. So we need connection. And this is a very interesting thing. If you can pop in to give an answer to that need and desire for connection, it's gold. It's interesting. This is an example from Antwerp, the city where I live very nearby. And this is a Bulgarian uh, sports coach, trainer, mentor. She's called uh, Didi Jordanova. She's, she's been living in Antwerp for, I think, more than 35 years. And she's giving live stream sports lessons at home. And a lot of people pop in into this initiative. And she also organizes this for companies, fit breaks. And it's enormous because it's, it are 30 minute sessions when people working at their office or at home, they are doing exercises, physical exercises. 
But in fact, it's not only the exercises, it's also the, the connection. For her is the connection, the, the main thing. She's bringing people together with these kind of exercises. And it's a fantastic initiative, trying to, to give an answer on this trend of finding connection today. Very interesting to follow. The last, the last topic is about convenience. Convenience has to do with ease of use, safety, shorter supply chains, but also more interesting local initiatives like local, uh, local services, local products, local arts and crafts, which is growing exponentially worldwide. Okay, why are these things growing exponentially? Because of ecological motives, of course, but also social cultural motives, economic motives, but also politically driven motives. Convenience is also about needs, values, desires of the citizens and consumers. Today, and this will happen again, this will happen, not again, this will happen uh, during this decade, we will go to a more organized contactless economy based on certain levels of safety. We are going to more contactless payments, to contactless travel, to contactless delivery, to virtual experiences. And of course, technology will take part in this, of course. Of course. Just, I give you an example of convenience. I said earlier in this presentation that one of the most beautiful uh, creations of our human ingenuity was money. Money was invented to pay people more efficiently for their services and products because of its uniform character, it's, it's universal and it's widely accepted. And that was the reason why money was such an interesting invention. But today we see that the physical carrier of money is disappearing. I predict that within five or 10 years time, but maybe it will be five years time, that banknotes and coins will have disappeared completely. They will disappear. In the contactless economy, the demand for cash and coins will disappear. And it has some reasons. It's economically because governments have more um, control over your financial transactions. But it's also about hygiene. Giving money to each other hands is not clean today because of COVID. That's the reason that we use today more and more digital payment mechanisms like payment cards, payment apps, and also, of course, Bitcoins, crypto coins. We see then, and you see the, the, the rate of the Bitcoin is going up. Eh? If, it, if you compare one Bitcoin is X ruble or X euro, it's enormous, enormous. And it has been growing the last, the last uh, seven, uh, 10 months, 12 months, very rapidly. But this is also very interesting what's happening today. Imagine that, let's say, bringing out money on the market is something that normally is only um, the case, or it's, let's say, a, a privilege only for countries and central banks. Now you see today that companies like Facebook and also other companies and individuals and organizations are bringing out cryptocurrencies. This is really nuts. Hey, Facebook will launch the yen. Hey, it was previously called the Libra. It will launch the yen. And some big companies, also Alibaba will do it in, in China. They will come with own coins and own crypto coins, own, own money. Very disruptive. But if we take this into account, a lot of other things will disappear. Like these guys, these um, ATMs, they will disappear. But also the same with um, banks in streets. In Belgium today, one bank in the street, a bank house, a physical location of a bank, they disappear. 
One, one a week is disappearing in Belgium at this moment. It's going very fast. So we are going to switch completely to a cashless economy, a cashless society. I can give you an example of China. These are two images of Chinese beggars. You don't have to give them coins. You don't have to give them banknotes. No, you can transfer money by using the the okay, it's called the, the QR code. If you're if you're using the QR code, you can transfer money. It's easy. This is an example. If we say that money is going to disappear and you see it already happening with Chinese beggars, then you know I'm telling the truth. We are also going from the perspective of the retail to a contactless customer journey. For the discovery of products, for demonstration and trial, for order and purchasing, for payments, of course, as I gave you the examples, but also for delivery and collection, and even in post, uh, post sale support. We are seeing this. I give you some last examples, some two or three examples, and then we can finish and go to the questions. This is an example of a Chinese jeweler, Ideal. It's a, Ch a Chinese jeweler chain, Ideal, and they quickly transformed and transitioned to a digital business model. They created virtual stores. And this happened at the beginning of COVID and at the beginning of the lockdown in China. And they launched the thousand people, the thousand stores initiative. And what was in fact the element they changed or they transformed the, let's say the people working physically in the stores into live show presenters. We call it also live streamed commerce. And what happened again, what also happened was that the jeweler partnered together with the live streaming agency and they used also influencers to train the staff. And they also looked at their product lines and their categories. And they saw that they could use maybe a, a more uh, a cheap, a cheaper line for younger consumers. And they also gave the people that were selling the products, they would give them a bigger commission. And at the end, it was a big success. They transformed and they made bigger benefit, more turnover and more profit if compared to the same period in the pre-COVID era. Interesting. But even Facebook also helps smaller companies all over the world to, to do this, to, to go over and to transform and to give more convenience to their customers by transforming to live stream commerce. They create tools for smaller companies to, to have like shop windows on Facebook and Instagram platforms. It changes completely the retail industry, completely. The last example is about delivery. It's about delivery of products. This is um, Alphabet, uh, one of uh, the Google's parent company, uh, of course. And they announced already in, uh, in full lockdown in the US or in full uh, uh, Corona crisis in the US, they formulated a program, they made a program, they announced a program. And in the beginning is it, was, it was a drone delivery for hospitals and it were needles and uh, medical equipment and toilet paper even. And Walgreens participated in that program and it was, let's say, transformed, it was transported to hospitals. But later on, also other companies popped in this initiative and they sold pasta and baby food and it was, uh, let's say, delivered to households in the state of Virginia in the US. And even a local bakery, a very local bakery in Virginia popped in into this initiative and it offered to its clients and customers pastries and, and bread. So it's possible. We are going also to a, a contactless delivery of products. We see it already today with a lot of initiatives. I finish with a last question. How can you think about more convenience about popping into a contactless society, a contactless economy. How can you do that? Think about it. It's, a, it's an open question for very keen students, for very uh, creative students. Try to find a solution to pop in 
and to find a way to cope with this trend of contactless economy and convenience. Okay, this, is, this was my lecture. I think I'm more or less in time. I think I, I may be 10 minutes over time, but we still have time for some questions. Yes, thank you very much for such a nice presentation. Everything was perfect. Uh, dear colleagues, if you have any questions, you are more than welcome, please. Oh, no questions. Or is it a, sh is it a chat also or not? Uh, okay, so uh, if no one has any questions, so I have some questions. Uh, Deborah, could you tell me please, how can an organization deal with uncertainties and crisis? I think that's a very good question, but I think that each organization has to think more and more in an organization and companies and even countries and governments. It's not only companies and organizations. You can, you can put it in a bigger perspective. I think that you, you need to do that. It's a, it's a way of it's scenario thinking. It's future thinking. You have to deal with uncertainties, build them into scenarios, and try to find ways to, to cope with that. Because I think it's very important. You also saw that when I gave my first part of the lecture, about uh, the wild cards, you have to integrate them. Maybe what I gave were more gener general, uh, general uh, wild cards, but you can also apply them more to your industry, to more to your organization. Wild cards that can happen. Uh, what if questions you have to ask? What, what will happen if, uh, what would we do if this happens? So these kind of questions you, you certainly need to ask and find creative solutions. And if you do that, you're better prepared for these uncertainties for the future. That's a way of, yeah, it's a more methodotic, methodological way of finding and, and uh, of building these, uh, these uh, wild cards into your, and uncertainties into your scenarios and finding solutions for that. That's a very important way. Thank you. And we have some questions in our chat box. So what will happen with um, warfare industry, weapons, wars, and, and, and so on? What, what was the question? I didn't... Uh, what will happen with the warfare industry, uh, with weapons the... and with wars, yeah. and so on? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, with the warfare industry? Yes, yes, with weapons. Yeah. Yeah, it will be more and more. Yeah. Somebody forgot to. Uh, dear colleagues, could you uh, could you switch off your microphone, please? I think you can mute them. Yeah, just again. I think it's. Uh, it's I'm I'm trying to do this. Okay. No, yeah, no, it's it's okay. yeah. The question was about warfare. I yeah. think that warfare will be more technological in the future. Um, we experienced in Russia. You experienced a, a, a bloody war. It's the Second World War was very. I think a lot. Of, I think that you had the most casuals. A lot of people dying in that war. And you also had Afghanistan and, and a lot of uh, smaller wars on your territory. In the future, wars will be more and more technologically, and it will be more and more cyber wars. It will be more biological wars. Uh, I think it, it, what can happen as well is that we have a lot of casu casualties as well, but it will be completely different, not devastating, completely infrastructures. But it will be more like economical warfare, uh, biological warfare, uh, technological warfare, maybe maybe putting a harbor um, uh, in, into a, or bomb a harbor. I think that will be more kind of wars that we will experience in the future. I okay. Think and uh, we have one more question. Do you think changes that happen to education, uh, online education, for example, university schools will persist? Yeah, I think... I <laughs> What we see today, uh, because I know that education and universities are, let's say, very um, conservative, to be, <laughs> to be frankly. I think that they're all, always conservative and changes in, 
in education and changes uh, in universities are going very, very slowly, yeah? as I said earlier. Today, what we saw with uh, COVID-19 is that they had to adapt very quickly to the new situation. Yeah? And we saw that people, uh, that uh, professors and, 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 and students had to uh, pop in very quickly to remote learning. Yeah? We had to find ways, we had to find uh, structures, we had to find uh, tools, we had to find um, uh, uh, mechanisms to, to let it work. And it happened and it worked. And that's what I think today that we are not going back. Even if COVID-19 is gone, it will, a kind, it will be a kind of hybrid situation. And we will go to college, we will go to university because we, we want to, to, to debate, we want to see our colleagues, we want to see the students, we need to, to give a, a lessons in class. It's important for the connection. It's important to deliver uh, knowledge and to, to, to communicate with one another. But sometimes it can be a, a big uh, opportunity to do it also online. For example, imagine in, an, in a complete new world with education, it can be possible that we make groups of students from all different universities and university colleges, for instance, from Belgium, from the Netherlands, from Brazil, from Russia, from Iran, from Korea, from South Africa. It will be possible. And you can connect with these students we can do maybe two or three events in an, off, in an offline world, real life events, for instance, in Belgium or in Russia or in South Africa, bringing everybody together, trying, getting to know each other, getting the assignments, and then go back home and collaborate with one another virtually. And in the end, when you have to deliver a project to bring all the students together again in another destination, and bringing all the colleagues again together. That will be possible. It's also possible what we see today also in, uh, in very expensive universities in America that are quite expensive is that students are complaining because they have to pay a lot of money to get in and to, to, uh, to, uh, to, to be part of that organization, to be part of that university. But imagine it's the same what happened with Netflix. In the, in, in the past you had you had um, video, video tapes, you had DVD DVDs, you had Blu-rays, and it was delivered to households or, or people were picking them up at video stores. That doesn't exist today. People are streaming. It will be more or less the same with, I think, with education. It will not be a completely streamed organization, completely virtually, but it will be a combination. And I think this hybrid form of education will survive and will be the new normal once COVID is gone. And because when COVID is gone, everybody will go back to university because you miss your friends, you miss your colleagues, you want to talk to one another, you will do that. But after the, a certain period, you will see that there were also some advantages and benefits in the COVID era. And then you will see <coughs> of both worlds and you combine them. And that will be the hybrid world. Thank you. And uh, are your trends applicable to the total world population uh, and applicable to all sectors and industries? I think so. These, the, these trends that I mentioned are applicable to because they are citizen trends and consumer trends. And consumers and citizens are operating in markets and industries so, and in, in, in organizations. So they're applicable. But let's say the, the translation of these bigger consumer and citizen trends to different markets can be filled in differently. But these trends are, let's say, universal for the next decade. OK, thank you. Any other questions? Can I ask a question if you have time? Of course. I uh, thank you for the uh, lecture. It was very different to other lectures at our faculty in a very good way. Okay, thank you. My question is about uh, European big business. Uh, yes. Since like uh, at the latest Davos summit uh, World Economic Forum, the theme was the Great Reset, which sounded like a European big business wants to uh, start a PR campaign for capitalism. Yes. And uh, at least in our faculty, the view is that uh, 
the post-war accord of European growth has been dead for a long time. The mm-hmm. accord between business, labor, and government. Mm-hmm. Uh, since your theme is very much uh, on the topic of changes in labor mm-hmm. and how business interacts with labor, uh, how do you think there will be some kind of uh, like post industrial fourth industrial revolution accord or some new arrangement of between labor government and business yeah in belgium what we see today um because uh, the government is giving a lot of money to companies that suffer from covid eh? you see that we have an enormous debt but we also see and that's uh, i think a new form of capitalism we had in europe the free capitalism you had in the past communism and what we are seeing today that a lot of european Uh, countries are evolving to a kind of combination of both. What we see today is that a lot of, um, it's not completely nationalized. eh? It's not that that government is nationalizing all industries. eh? It's not like that. But we are evolving to a more state capitalism. It's in fact the the state, the government that is helping. It was was already with the banking crisis. eh? A lot of European, a lot of European governments took over banks to to help them to support them. If they didn't do that, then the economy would have collapsed completely in uh, in in the world, in Western Europe, of course, but I think also globally. So we did that, and now we are also seeing that with airlines, with let's say the industries that suffer the most, they are being helped with a lot of money. But the big question will. How do we pay this back? Because we are making debt, and you have to pay back your debt sometime. When? It's a, when is a big question mark today. How is a question mark today? But we have to be aware that we have to pay it back. And for the labor market, um, there was yesterday a big uh, debate uh, in parliament, and there was also a strike in Belgium because of what a few political parties wanted to give extra money to, uh, to, uh, to employees. But then you said the, the economists and other political parties in the same government are saying, yeah, yeah, but you can't do that because you're now thinking that the economy is doing very well, but the government is paying all the, all the, all the bills today. And this is for the current situation, but we can't keep going on like this forever. We can do it maybe extra few months, maybe till the end of the year, but then it has to finish. The economy has to recover. The economy has to find out itself and you need to, to give, you need to pay back little by little. And it's not the time now to give employees more money. So you, we have this discussion today in government. You have people, left-wing parties uh, versus right-wing parties, but also economists to one another. It's. It's, it's a complete mess today, complete situation about, yeah, about this, uh, this, uh, yeah, this, um, this thing. So I'm not sure b- b- what direction we will going on, but I think more and more we will evolve to the kind of state, com- uh, state capitalism, more and more. It's a big state intervention, still capitalism, but very controlled. A bit a combination of old communism and, and free capitalism, I think kind of fusion between both. One more question. Uh, what are the most dangerous threats of the future in your opinion? Globalization, terrorism, ecological disasters, and so on. I think ecological disaster. The climate change is, is affecting all of us. I think we will, I gave you some examples. Eh? Like, I think we will experience once a very big terroristic attack with biological weapons that will happen once and it will be also devastating but it's not that it will be it will take it will take some time to heal eh, for the planet and the people suffering from that but it's the climate change is 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 like a pandemic but it's it's we don't see it a pandemic you see people wearing face masks you hear people going to hospital you get reports of people dead people uh, infected We see a lot of reports, not always (laughs) right news, sometimes also manipulated news, to be honest, but we see evidence from that. For climate change, it goes beyond beyond what we see. It's 
it's unimaginable. You can see the small signs. And if you combine these signs, you have patterns. But it takes a lot of time. But when we reach a certain point, that tipping point, maybe we can't go back anymore. And that's something that I feel very, uh, very, um, very strongly because if I see how we reacted, how people reacted on COVID um, measures that our government uh, took, and also in other countries, in especially Western Europe and also in America, yeah, it was difficult eh, to 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 uh, uh, to to, um, to keep the rules eh, to to stay uh, to to. Act. To align with the rules that were that were uh, that were uh, uh, by, that were rolled out by the government, you saw that this was happening in in Asia very better. It was in, in Asia the people more um, were in line with the rules, and that's also what you see today. That in Asia, COVID is still there but very limited, and the economy of China, China is one of the economies that is growing up. Yeah? China is the, the only economy in 2020 that grew. All the other economies dropped, but the Chinese economy flourished. So, yeah, it's, it's um, at, but, but climate change, if, if we can't cope with the rules for COVID-19, the rules that we, or the measurements that we have to take, the measures that we have to take to control climate change are much bigger. And I don't think if I see behavior of people in general, eh, not individual behavior, but general behavior, I don't think we can, we can manage that. I'm not sure if we can manage that. From that, from that perspective on, I'm quite pessimistic. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so thank you very much because the time of our meeting is over. Thank you for such a nice presentation for your lecture and thank you everybody for coming. Yeah. And we will be glad to see everybody again on our other seminars. Thank okay. you very much. Okay, bye. thank you. Have a nice evening. Have a nice evening. I, I don't know how to say it in Russian, but have a nice evening. Bye bye. See you bye again. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank you.